what do we do with it? And our answer was the following. N no idea. No idea. No idea if it's good. It could be brilliant for all I know, but I have no idea. And more importantly, I have no idea what I would do with it if I was you either. So um, two weeks later, we took back this, um, which was the answer to the question, what is our patient experience? And we played this film for seven and a half minutes without speaking. And the client was pissed off, to say the least. Um, and they said, I, what the fuck's this? You know, we said, if you're a patient in a hospital, you lie in a bed all day, and you look at the roof. This is Christian. He works at IDEO. He's one of our researchers, human factors researchers. And he just simply was a patient for 24 hours in a hospital. So he lie there with a video camera, and he just videoed what he saw, which was the roof. And so often, organizations ask us to come in and solve incredibly complicated problems, and they spend all this time and energy developing, no disrespect, shit that looks like this, and they've totally forgotten the main point of what it is that they're doing, which is human beings have to be the solution, or you have to at least see the problem from the human being's point of view. So what we went and did with this was we co-created with nurses, with hospital administrators, with patients and with doctors, a variety of ideas. This is a silly little workshop. Not a single IDO person is in this, but this is a bunch of nurses acting out a little play that they were making about <laughs> scanning a <laughs> patient. <laughs> I think she's driving a cart or something. I don't even know what they're doing. Not really the point. The point is that they're, <laughs> they're designing with us. <coughs> the point is that, that, that the design has now become something we're doing together. So we're not going away and designing for them. We're in a room designing with them. And that's a really important distinction. And I'm going to talk a lot about this throughout the course of this presentation. So here's some things that came out of it. Now, I'm a designer, and I care about beauty, right? I care about the way things look. So I'm not going to lie to you and say, oh my god, these are awesome and fantastic and look like iPods. They're amazing. They aren't. But they're really interesting, because they were created by patients, by nurses, and by doctors. So this here is a nurse, obviously. And she was one of the people that you just saw in the video. And she wanted people to know what she did. So she created a little thing on her leg that said, I'm a guide, so that people didn't stare at her and thought that she was going to, you know, that she was going to instruct evil on them, that she was actually a really helpful person. So she wanted to redefine her role. This thing here, you see this sort of weird little thing here. This is a tiny mirror from a bicycle, like this big, that a patient glued on with a piece of cardboard here onto the trolley that wheels them around, so that when they're being wheeled around, you can have a conversation. It's like a rear view mirror in a car. So that again, you know, you don't, people don't think you're dead. They can actually see that you're alive. Um, this is the hospital administrator who had a really simple idea, which is when I'm looking at all this person's charts at the end of the bed, I have no idea who this person is. Why don't we take a Polaroid of them, <gasps> radical idea, when they come in and stick it at the end of their bed so that we can actually see that there's a human being here and not, a, not just a patient. Kind of simple. Patient's idea. I don't want my room to look like the hospital corridor. I want my room to be different because it's my room. So the hospital corridor has tile, and the room, which looks like a room, has wood. Last couple of ideas. You know when you break your arm and you have plaster on your arm and people write on it? Little a patient's daughter had this fantastic idea of wouldn't it be great in the hospital room to have a whiteboard with markers so that when the patient was lying there, you could write on there and say, I'm sorry you're ill, mommy, or I'm sorry I didn't get to see you. So again, very, very simple ideas, but really nice expressions of sort of human kindness. And I think that's kind of the point of what a lot of what we do, is just these very simple moments. I love that I'm competing with a robot. That's genius. Um, so we went away and designed, sort of designed this properly. So you can start to see all of these ideas kind of come into place, technicians, laying down what everything was so everybody knew this is a bed, this is a monitor, this lady's a technician, not this sort of scary equipment. Here's the whole check-in process, or sort of looking at it, the whole check-in process, and this nurse is going to guide you through, and again, using technology to create the whole system. 
Here's the ER, where it's very quick. As it, ERs, uh, emergency rooms are absolutely nightmarish experiences in most hospitals anyway. All these terrifying people sort of running around screaming and bleeding. So, you know, making it very clear and calm to people that this was actually the process. So this is a very boring chart, but this is from our client, and they implemented 37 of these ideas in less than eight months. So again, you know, this whole idea of incredibly complicated numeric solutions I don't think is appropriate in many cases. Very, very simple things where just using your eyes, the great phrase a client of ours uses all the time, designers think with their eyes. I love that phrase. So we're always looking at the world, we're always processing the world in a certain way, we're always looking for ideas, and we're always translating those ideas into real solutions. That's what we do. So, people as inspiration, you saw that, co-created, you saw that, prototyped, you saw it in cardboard, impactful on multiple levels. Most important to us is that it is an impactful on the human level. We care that our clients make money, but we don't design things just to make money. They have to add value to somebody. So, Pascal's going to start talking about our journey, and then I'm going to come back in a second. Clicker. Yes. So let's back up a second. Um, we are so most known for creating a lot of products, and you see some of them here, and that's very easy to communicate because a product is out on the market. You could say, hey, we're involved in this. Isn't this great? Um, so that's what still our DNA is. That's what we started with. That's what we still do. And this product, for example, many of you will know from a museum, right? IDEO developed the first, IDEO, the first Apple mouse ever in 1980. Uh, this is an x-ray image of it, by the way. And uh, we used the same kind of very simple prototyping methods Paul just talked about. So the first prototype for the mouse was actually a soapbox with a bouncy ball beneath it. And that we used to find out what the best geometric configuration is. And this was the first endurance test for the mouse to see whether the technology we developed for the inside would actually withstand repeated use for over a long period of time. Just FYI, the guy that took this picture still uses this turntable. <laughs> so he's some <laughs> ancient engineer. We love him. And um, he has this turntable still, and he still uses it, still working. So even 30 years ago, you know, it was very much about very rough, quick prototyping, answer an a, a question quickly rather than spending a whole lot of time developing a theory and then kind of um, answering it the last minute. And Going forward 20 years, we are still doing that. This is a product we developed for PNG, which is an answer to the question, what would a Swiffer look like for carpeted floor? So what is a very simple cleaning device with no moving parts that allows me to actually quickly clean the carpet without getting the vacuum cleaner out and so on and so forth? Uh, this is the final product. You know, This is a stage along the way. Still very simple, very rough prototypes that test the function very quickly to see whether we're on the right path. And if we are great, we develop it further to more and more sophisticated stages. If we aren't, we found out within the first day or two, you know, not, not after 12 weeks or so. Um, we're also interested very much in designing products that last. Uh, it's no value to anybody if we develop the latest and greatest product that is obsolete within a year or two. We actually think of it as a success if it actually spans a longer period of time. So this vacuum cleaner, for example, went into production seven years ago, and we actually think it could still go on for another seven. It's still, the design is still relatively timeless and, um, and, and still works. Same with this one. This is a CD player we designed for Muji, um, which I'm sure you know. Uh, and it was designed after a Japanese bathroom fan which really only has one control, which is the cord. You pull it to switch it on, and you pull it to switch it off again, and that's it. So it's extreme simplicity in a product, product that at the time, 10 years ago, was uh, very becoming very, very complex with lots of buttons and LEDs and LCD displays and so on and so forth, and this was the con counterpoint to that. And interestingly, nowadays, CD players have all but vanished because the technology is obsolete, but this is still being produced, and this is still being sold, and this is still making incredible amounts of revenue for the client because it is a design icon, it's a design classic. It was never fashionable, but it's endured longer than any other product in that market. We also help our clients oftentimes to commercialize certain technologies or certain materials. In this case, working with BASF, who came to us and said, we have this amazing material which is really heat resistant and very heat absorbent, or, or, in, or heat insulating, rather. Uh, yet it's only being used in certain applications in the car industry, yet it could do so much more. Can you help us 
find out and exper experiment with what else it could do. And so we agreed to do a few concept products around the household that really showcase the properties of that material. And this is the travel hair dryer, which because of the properties of the material doesn't need any handle, is very compact. Um, and another one is a water kettle that is actually styled after carafe. That's an opportunity you can only really um, do with this kind of material because of the properties of the material this works. Um, or a light fixture which actually doesn't have any metal parts apart from the cable. So the cable, wi the wire is directly cast into the body of the lamp which is also the fitting and you can use it standing down or hanging up and you can touch it, it doesn't get too hot. Um, so this, these are not real products and they're not out in the market. These are just expressions of what the material can do. So it's a translation. A lot of our work is about translation. Translation from uh, need into an opportunity or translation from the abilities of a material into a, a product. So Nokia came to us with this product here, the N-Gage. Remember the N-Gage? God, potato, right? Um, and we said very nicely to them, um, if you want us to, and they asked us to design the, the service, the N-Gage service, and we said, we say this with love, this thing is a potato, and it needs to be redesigned um, because we can't design a service for it unless the product itself matches the service that we're going to put on it. So we redesigned the product and the service that went on it, and we've had a long and successful relationship with Nokia ever since. Um, product service overlap started for us a while back. One of the first products we ever did was for Prada, um, where we worked with Ram Koolhaas to design all the technology that went into the Prada um, Epicenter store in Manhattan. I'll show you a short video of some of those things, because they seem kind of funny and dated now, but they're worth revisiting. This is radio for RFID tagging. I'm sorry about the horrendous music. Sort of bark or some awful thing. Scanning devices for inventory control, and the customer themselves had a radio frequency tag that allowed all of their data and preferences to be stored, a laser pointer that controlled the whole experience, so that you were able to pull up catwalk stuff on demand, you were able to show other styles that went with it. I mean, the whole thing was a sort of service experience. Um, interestingly, the well, actually, I'll let, let, let this continue. Sorry, music can go back up. I'll, I'll tell you a funny anecdote about, sort of failure anecdote about this in a second. like glass, and no big deal now, it's kind of in every boutique hotel bathroom. Um, and then finally, one of the sort of ones we were very excited about was this thing called the Magic Mirror, um, which guys absolutely love and women hate. Um, it's a plasma screen, you'll see it in a second, it comes up. Here it is. Um, it's a plasma screen embedded into a mirror that allows you to rotate 360 degrees and look at your ass from behind. Um, which women loathe and guys think is awesome. Um, so what was interesting about this, and I think it's one of the things that, that we need to sort of talk more about generally, is the idea of failure. Um, this was successful because it made, you know, made Prada seem as you know, experimental and 
wildly kind of groovy at the time, but it didn't really succeed in terms of drawing the Prada customer into the store experience. I mean, the Prada customer, if you think about them, spending huge amounts of money, very sophisticated, probably quite well-traveled, doesn't really want interruption in that service. They just usually want to buy and get out. What this did, which I thought was very interesting, is it attracted, in, in general, 14-year-old girls from the suburbs of New York to come in and play with the changing room, kind of doing this for hours, but not actually transact. So it's kind of one of those things, again, with technology, I think it's quite, I, I applaud Prada for doing this because I think it's very brave to put themselves out there, but you've got to be very careful with technology, and I say this to clients a lot, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And I think there's a lot of technology in there, and a lot of it we designed, that didn't really add a lot of hu a huge amount of value to that experience. And I think that's one of those things that we're constantly sort of checking with our clients is, yes, you can design something that's going to make a cup of tea and, you know, wash your clothes, but do you really need it? And I think that's kind of, an, and again, particularly in a conference like this, quite an interesting checker around technology where we're often saying to clients, do you really need that? Do clients really, do, do consumers really need that? Anyway, Pascal, we'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about energy now. One of the spaces that are really interesting for us r right now is the energy space. Because the whole industry is shifting, it used to be a monopolized type of industry, right? Every country had their energy provider or a few of them, and they sent you their bill at the end of the month or the year, and that was it. And um, that's that has changed dramatically. So nowadays, these are companies who all of a sudden have to face things like competition, like consumer demand. They have to build a brand. They're even expected to help people conserve energy, and people don't usually believe them because they say, "You sell me energy. Why would I? Why would you help me use less?" So it's a very complex field, and and technology is also changing rapidly. One of the things uh, that are changing is smart meters are coming pretty quickly. Actually, many countries are demanding smart meters to put in, into place, which help you track your energy usage and helps the energy company also to see how energy is being used at large. So it's basically the the customer-facing bit of the smart grid. And uh, we worked with Yellow, who have a very strong brand in Germany. They're actually the first, uh, first energy brand in Europe, I would say, who've successfully gone into the consumer space in a really strong and unique way. Um, and we developed the smart meter with them, which uh, really needed to speak to the brand and needed to kind of create a coherent experience between the product and the interaction, say, on screen and their brand communication materials. Um, so the task here was express our brand in a way that makes sense in the context of what's already there, which is this, all standardized meters. So it was something that still looked the part, did the job, but also expressed this is about simplicity and value for money, which this brand very much is about, uh, and immediately looks different at first glance so that when I have this thing installed in my home, immediately I know something has changed and I now have a whole world of opportunity that I didn't have before. Um, and then to go along with that, of course, the service to actually track my usage and so on and so forth. And in that same vein, but very different type of client, we worked with the Department of Energy in the US to uh, help them help consumers conserve energy. Uh, so we helped them basically to make their communication towards energy users less general, more personal, and less national and more local to basically custom tailor it much more to what people really care about. Because what a lot of uh, players in the energy field notice is that they speak on very general terms, but they don't really reach consumers through something that they care about. Uh, so, you know, some, some of the things that just are, again, only examples of what that could mean is something like a predictive bill. So could you, based on the past years, predict what the energy bill over the next few months <coughs> would normally be. And what you do there is connect with people's competitive spirit. So as soon as you do that, people will try to undercut that bill because <coughs> they think, actually, I can do better than last year, and next year I'll be better still. So you need to basically really give them a chance to compete either against themselves or against others in order to make this relevant in their heads. Because otherwise, energy is, why do I care? It's there. Another way to connect is through house prices. This is something that people care about. They care about the value of their property, particularly in the US, particular, particular in the last two years. Mm. Um, so can we work with, uh, with, s with cities, basically, to really make that transparent? What is a house worth? But also, what's the operating cost? And if I can lower the operating cost of my house, I can basically increase its value come sale time. So at the latest, when I sell the house, 
I'll get payback because I have made all these investments into my house that save energy. And similar, what do people care about on a more mundane level? It's the weather, really. It's going to be super hot, and my air conditioning is really old and doesn't work very well. What else can I do to really make it through the next few weeks you know, feeling better than I usually do? You know, we could actually go into local communication media like, like local newspapers and connect it to the weather report saying, you know what, it's going to be really hot the next two weeks. Here are four very simple things that you can do to conserve energy and make the atmosphere in your house more pleasant in the process. So, me, yes? Is it me? Yes, it's me. Okay, this was... I'll, I'm going to go pretty quickly because I think we want to get some time at the end for questions. We were hired by Bank of America to do the following. Um, it's kind of a boring brief. Develop a new path for revenue growth by tailoring products and services for boomer women with kids. I don't even know what that means. I think it was come up with cool ideas. Um, and we were really interested in talking to people um, about their savings behavior. Um, so... We don't do focus groups, first of all. Focus groups suck, right? Nobody wants to talk a behind a one-way mirror at 7 o'clock at night about anything. Um, we think that alcohol and pizza are a very, very interesting way of getting people to say insightful things, so we tend to do that. So we had a party here and asked people about savings. Um, a couple of things came out loud and clear. One was that people cared about the idea of saving, but they weren't really bothered about how much they saved. So when you said to people, how much is in your savings account, they'd say, I don't know, no idea weren't really that bothered. Um, this was really interesting. This is a photograph from an observation where we saw a lady in California paying her Pacific gas and electric bill. She owed the electricity company $27.40, and she rounded the bill up when she gave them a check to $30. We said, that's kind of interesting. Why are you doing that? And she said, well, it's sort of easy, really, because it's an easier number to remember, right? We said, okay, that's, that's, that's fine, but is there anything else? And she said, well, they owe me money now. So there was this sort of transference in power, which was kind of an interesting thing to watch. And we saw this again and again, this idea of rounding up numbers. I want to round it up. So we created 42 concepts around various ideas around saving. Number 12 was this idea here. Go into a store and buy a cup of coffee for $1.50. Pay for it with your keep the change debit card that we designed. Bank of America rounds it off to $2.00. Bank of America transfers 50 cents from your checking to your savings account and matches 5% of the annual total up to $250. So basically, they just take all the bits of change, you know the penny jar that we all throw our shit into every night? We turn that into a service. Here's the service. Keep the change. Here's the crappy advertising that we didn't do, but there it tells the story really well of, you know, now a credit card that kind of does what you've been doing here. Here are the numbers. 12 million new customers since launch, $3.1 billion saved, 1 million new savings account in year one alone, 95% awareness, 99% compliance. This is their most successful service ever, and it was launched in less than eight months. And so I always say this, everybody's obsessed with big ideas. What's the big idea? Oh, I want to disrupt. I want to be the next biggest thing ever. I'm actually not a fan of big ideas because I think they're all just way too complicated. I'm a big fan of little ideas. And this is a very little idea. And it's very, very smartly executed by them in most cases. So they took an existing behavior, which is saving, just kind of doing this. They took their existing infrastructure, credit and debit cards, which they already had, and they built a service around it. And the numbers prove. So to me, that's a big idea for clients when they make billions of dollars of saving for people and they can implement it quickly. So, talk a little bit more about our world. Our world is now moving even more broadly into the world of experience design. And I'm just going to run through a series of things. We worked with Bono to help him create Product Red's music service, all consumer-created music brand. We went out, and we, you know, all the modern stuff, Facebook and MySpace and all the usual tools were on all of those things now gathering insight, creating communities, co-creating with consumers. We regularly post questions on Facebook. We're now creating a network for ourselves, an innovation network, an open source network. We're mad not to, where we're constantly asking people to design with us. That's the final service. It's up and running. Um, second one, interesting, Shimano came to us um, and asked, Shimano are a bike parts manufacturer. And they said, can you create a new platform for the bicycle industry? Who here a really digs cycling? Anybody? Hands up. Do you wear Lycra and all that hideous shit? No? Well done. Um, these guys 
I hate these guys. I took this picture myself. This is in California. These people that dress like this with the lycra and all this crap and the helmets and this ridiculous approach to, the t to cycling, which is almost fascistic in its approach, and we decided that there was an opportunity to do something different. So a group of us talked to people about cycling, and this picture here on the left was one that we really liked, which is a picture that we saw again and again of somebody who'd had a bike when they were a child or an, a teenager, and they'd held it and they'd kept it for years in their attic because they didn't want to let go of it. I was one of those people. And I remember saying, I remember being nine years old and taking my hands off the handlebars and pretending I was ET and pretending I was flying and I wanted cycling to be like that again. So a series of insights around the idea of bikes being simpler. I don't want to be, you know, uh, I just want to ride. I don't want to be a cyclist. And I don't need all this technical shit. I just want to kind of get on and ride. We thought that was an interesting opportunity. So when we went out and talked to consumers, we found again and again that this was the case. This is an interview with a consumer in California. Hi. Hi. Do you work here? I do. Oh, good. Um, I'm hoping you can help me. I know nothing whatsoever about bikes. Okay. And I'm interested in, I know what I don't want to do with the bike. Okay. Which is, I'm not going to race it. I'm mm -hmm. not going to wear skin tight clothes. I'm not going to climb the Page Mill Hill. Or oh, does that make sense? Not really. I mean, the trail is not hardcore really trails. We're talking very infrequent. Yeah. Okay. Like something that we can a, ride recreationally. Like a fire not, road you know, we're not running first, races. Not like a, we're not riding marathons. Okay. We're just um, sure. Possibly a hybrid might be the kind of bike. Okay, now what is a hybrid? Because I have no clue. And then you were saying there are different levels of this in between hybrid. And there's all different types of hybrids. Because okay. there's hybrids where without they don't have a front shock. Okay, when you do that, you get more of the money that you pay into the parts. What is the difference between a mountain bike and a regular bike? Well, I mean, when you say a bike... I like a 10-speed. 10-speeds, um, they kind of don't exist anymore. You really can't find them. But 10-speeds are... See how outdated I am? <laughs> so they used to talk about speeds, like... Mm -hmm. Like, what was the old days? And last time I looked at a bike, it was like, what, 15 speeds or right. 10 speeds? And you know, like, yeah, I'm looking for a so-and-so XPSLR with so-and-so, you know, oh, you know, you just need a bike. I just need a bike. Everybody nodding, right? We all just want a bike. None of us want all this crazy shit all the time. Um, so we built that bike. We built a prototype. This was kind of laughingly known as the Muji bike at the office. Um, super stripped down, super simple, automatic three gears. The saddle lifted off so you could put stuff in it, and it was super simple. This was a prototype. We took this to manufacturers. Manufacturers got really excited. Four manufacturers signed up and built these bikes. Um, we built a community around this whole idea. We called it Coasting. We worked with an, an American advertising agency, Crispin Porter Bogusky, and the whole thing was about this idea of going off-road, closing your eyes, and just being on a bike. None of this technical rubbish. Um, we jokingly said in a brainstorm, in fact, I said it, you should probably launch this on something like Ellen DeGeneres. She's Ellen DeGeneres, American, you know, American personality. She's kind of laid back. She's kind of cool. So they did. This so is very loud. Uh, here's uh, something. Where is the, the <laughs> this is the coolest thing. This bike. <gasps> oh, oh, wow. I'm telling you, a trick bike. Wait a minute. Hey, oh, you know this bike? Well, it's a trick bike. Yes. <laughs> it's a trick bike, and uh, it goes uh, three speeds automatically. It decides when to shift, and uh, it, it, it tells you. And then also, the, the, um, there's a way to lift this up. I wish someone would have. Um, <laughs> oh, here. Here, and you can put like your wallet and your keys and your stuff, your mark marker. Um, and uh, it's worth uh, about 600 bucks. Wow. And uh, it's actually a really cool. I've been riding r this around the office all day long today. <laughs> and I liked it so much, I decided that maybe everybody in the audience should. Oh. I'll spare the hysteria, but she gave one to everyone in the crowd. Okay, numbers. 30,000 units sold in year one, which in this space is a big idea. Seven OEMs committed to coasting products for 2009. Most importantly, the Lime Coaster, which was the one you just saw there, is Trek's biggest selling bike by volume. So again, you know, this isn't just weird guys with post-it notes making up stuff in a, in a room in California or London. This is business, you know, and this is business value that we're creating for our clients. So moving, continuing this journey, you know, again, some just sort of flashcards. We're now in increasingly involved in things which I would describe as social. So we've recently been working with the American Red Cross to help the whole blood donation process be more human, back to the hospital bed at the beginning, 
Nothing is more terrifying than giving blood. It's a frightening experience. Trying to make this whole experience, you know, more human-centered. We've been working with them and prototyping. Again, you see the prototypes, cardboard, bits and bobs, <laughs> prototyping this whole experience. You'll see an experience in a second that we just recently finished for Air New Zealand where we built an entire airplane and seats in cardboard. So we do this regularly. Um, last one, well, Pascal's going to talk to you about a local case history, which you thought might be kind of great, because it's actually premiering here in Madrid. Um, so we thought you might enjoy seeing a local little case history. Not so little, kind of big, actually. Yeah, just to make sure that doesn't, that doesn't all seem very remote and abstract. Yeah. Um, this is about work we've done over the past three years with BBVA, and the brief was... The following, unlock the commercial possibilities of the self-service channel. In other words, uh, you could translate it like this. ATMs are not exactly a contemporary experience. They kind of are very antiquated. Uh, yeah. As all of you are aware, I'm sure. Here are two images, 30 years apart. The ATM is actually 40-some years old by now. Not a whole lot had changed, right? More features more slots, slightly bigger screen, slightly smaller card. The first ATMs actually worked with a radioactive check that you inserted 40 years ago, and now it's plastic cards. But beyond that, same experience, right? Despite all the advances in IT and banking and so on and so forth. Uh, and adding those features hadn't necessarily attracted everybody yet. There are still plenty of people who say ATMs isn't really for me. It can do a whole lot of things, especially here in Spain. It can do an amazing amount of things, all kinds of features. But, you know, thinking about it, I might as well go to the teller. I have a person in front of me. It seems like a more kind of human intuitive experience. Uh, so how do we speak to more people? Not necessarily how do we make it more features, but how do we basically improve the experience? Uh, also, on a different angle, the ATM industry, as it works so far, doesn't really allow any bank to differentiate their brand, right? Because ATMs are developed at the manufacturer, they're sold to banks, banks put them in front of users. Which means, like, all ATMs out there are basically just a variation on the theme, and they're more or less undistinguishable. So no brand can really create value out of an ATM in terms of differentiating itself from its competitor. Entering the new BBVA ATM, which is actually currently being piloted in this city. So there's five branches which you can go to in the city where this is being tested out right now, where working machines are, uh, are located, um, which is, again, designed very much based around human needs um, and really creates a disruptive change in that industry as a whole, not just in the user experience, but also in how the industry works. Um, so here you see three of them. Um, the design principles that we worked on very much were around privacy, around intuitiveness, around personalization, and adding an element of delight, which might seem kind of surprising given the fact that this is a quote-unquote boring ATM. And I'll just give a one example for each of those. Um, the first one's privacy. Have you ever noticed that it's a really uncomfortable feeling standing in front of a wall getting your money out with a queue behind you? Who has experienced that? Right. Okay. So how would it be if we turned the whole setup 90 degrees so that you actually interact with a machine shielded by a privacy glass and you have the queue in the corner of your eye at 90 degrees? Would that be better? Probably. We also included a bit of space to put your stuff between you and the wall where it's quite protected. So if you come with shopping bags, you can drop them there. You don't have to be afraid that it's uh, being stolen, which creates the basis really for people to engage in the interaction on a deeper level and not just go do whatever they have to really quick and leave again. So how do you, how do you give people that peace of mind to actually go and, and interact with the machine in the first place? Um, then around intuitiveness, this is very much about the interface, of course. And in this little animation, you see a very intuitive interface which seamlessly combines the real world and then the world inside the machine so that we can use the big screen as quasi a window into the machine. So you see money is being counted out. It drops down. It comes out of the slot. You also see that, um, maybe just play it again, Paul, 
um, we have gotten rid of a whole lot of clutter on the machine. There is one place to put your card, and beyond that, there's only one slot where everything else comes out. Any receipt, money, coins, everything else comes out this one slot that opens right here in order to make it an easier experience for everybody and not have the feeling like, did I take my receipt? Did I take the money? Did I take the coins? It's only one place to, to concentrate on. Personalization is also very important because this is about people. This is not about accounts. So one of the feature that we worked hard with BBA to implement is that this actually lets you see your financial situation across accounts. One of the things we saw when we talked to users in the beginning of the project is very much banking is not just a personal affair, it's very much a family affair. So I might want to see my account and a joint family account, and maybe my wife even lets me see her account, and I want to see that landscape at one glance across those accounts. So again, shifting the focus from the financial product to the users and letting them work on their terms rather than on the bank's terms. And finally, Delight. We have this big screen now which we implemented, um, which allows us to actually have some fun with it. And this is a character we created. We call him the hero. He's a man who lives inside the machine. And this is him explaining how the withdrawal process works. You can actually choose whether you want smaller or bigger bills. Let's go. So you'll see the hero in the machines that are, that are up here in Madrid as well, used for advertising and explaining the machine itself. So what we did here is going from people to design to prototyping. You see our very first rough prototypes on the right. Um, and then went and partnered with manufacturers. So that is def definitely taking what the industry does and turning it on its head. So rather than going to NCR who is building these machines and saying, we'll buy a machine off of you that you've already developed, we said, we have this design vision and we want you to implement it according to that vision. So we partnered up with NCR for the hardware, with Fujitsu for the software, and it obviously took a huge leap of faith from our client BBVA to let us do this, because nobody had ever done this before, um, to actually go and develop this machine from scratch. It took about two years, and, um, and now it's in the market. So I'm going to run, because we're getting past out of time, and those guys down the other end are loud, and they're annoying me. OK, um, a couple more. Um, this just came out. I don't know if you guys have seen this in the press. This is Air New Zealand's new economy class seating. Average flight time to New Zealand is sort of in the 20 plus hours range. It's pretty sucky. Um, so we did this for them, um, which is called the Sky Couch. Here's a quick video that shows you how it was working. Playing the innovations company, they IDEO, made this. This is our video. The US to gather insights about the way our customers travel. What we found was that some people think of a long haul flight as a time to be social, and others would rather just keep to themselves. It had to work for everyone. We ran a series of seat boot camps to put local design talent through its paces. It was an awesome project to, uh, to kick off with and one of those uh, real challenges that you uh, don't often get in your lifetime. Perhaps in, in simple terms, a bit like a sandpit where you can just start from, from nothing and create whatever you want to do. Uh, no boundaries, no limits um, and just tease out all the different concepts and ideas that everybody has. We tried some uh, things like people standing up, uh, sitting together, facing each other like they're around the kitchen table at home. Um, even stacking people up on top of each other in bunks. The bunk bed is one of the really interesting concepts, but it put people in a position of being totally undignified in that sort of environment. The bunk bed failed. Um, here's the finished idea. It's called the Sky Couch. It's basically taking a very simple idea, three seats with three leg rests that you can turn into a big couch and lie on. It comes out next year, putting it on all their, fla all their fleet. Cardboard to business and everything else in between. So that's going to be fun. Um, I'm going to just rattle through the last bit of this. I mean, increasingly now, our work is involved around designing human behavior. Um, most recently, I don't know if you guys have seen this in the press, we were asked to help take 
some r sort of shared responsibility for the Transportation Service Authority, which are the guys that were put in place in US airports after 9-11. Tough gig, right? So these guys, you know, difficult job for them and difficult job to try and create something different around taking a set of behaviors, which are people who are behaving like security guards, and teach them how to behave differently. Um, so again, you know, in, in the way that we do, we built a cardboard airport. Um, here it is up here. This is a, in a hangar in Baltimore. Um, and we took a series of operatives through a series of workshops to train them about certain kinds of behaviors. So you want to be less like a nightclub bouncer and more like a park ranger. You want to be less like you're in an emergency room and more like you're in an operating room. And then we took 60, uh, 600 of them through this workshop. Those 600 trained 6,000. Those 6,000 have now trained 60,000. So 60,000 people were designed and their behaviors were designed through our methodology, which is really interesting. Here they are. Um, again, increasingly now we're designing things where it's for designing for somebody who hasn't got the expertise of the object we're designing for them. This is a hearing device to teach people how to train other people for hearing, for hearing loss. Um, and again, these often these people are in places like India or Bangladesh where they're not trained doctors, so enabling them to do their own hearing training with a manual and with a toolkit that we created was what we designed here. Last one on this space, this is Intercell. This is a really interesting one. This is a needleless vaccination that we're prototyping right now, enabling people who are not trained doctors to give vaccinations out again in places where there aren't enough medical help. So the, again, the social dimension of what we do is incredibly important. This word, everywhere. I mean, this is the last section and I'm gonna talk about this kind of to the end. Different for us, different world, but very exciting, very motivating, very motivating for all of us to feel like that what we do matters in the world, that we are actually helping change people's lives. Different set of skills are required, much more collaborative, much more transparent. I mean, when you're working with government or with you're working with NGOs, your work has to be in the public domain. You can't hide, nor should you. Everything has to be transparent. And most importantly, this idea that I've described here as post-ego, the designer who wants to make this fabulous vision and create it themselves, that doesn't work in this space. This is about teaching. This is about enabling other people to create. And that's more often than not, that's what we do now. So I'm going to run you through a variety of examples and allow a couple of minutes for questions. We did this with the Gates Foundation. This is helping create a culture around teaching innovation. We created a toolkit. 29,000 of them have now been um, downloaded from our website. It is free. One could argue, why would the Gates Foundation want to get their competition to be able to download something that they've created? Well, the answer is because they care about the problem more than they care about owning the solution. Here we are out in India working with people there to help create different solutions. All the toolkit that we produce is all available. Everybody can download it. Everybody can use it. We don't feel like we need to own it. Again, increasingly areas such as vision and sight. You know, we work a lot with Arab and Eye Hospitals. This is Vision Spring out in India, which is all about bringing people better sight so that they can, they can work more effectively. And again, there's not enough medical staff out there to be able to do this. So teaching non-medical professionals how to do simple things like eye tests. How can a child do a nice test for their mother, for their grandmother, on cataracts? A couple more. This is for Gates and Acumen. This is a this is a project called the Ripple Effect, bringing the Gates Foundation and Acumen Fund together to help look at water. And one of the world's biggest problems, if not the biggest problem, right now is sanitary water around the world. We created a contest where people around the world were able to bring ideas together, create prototypes, and eventually solutions around water carrying, water transportation, and water purification. The whole thing was on a blog. Everything, again, all the tools, all the techniques, everything completely transparent, everything completely open. So, the, the end. Where are we now? 2010. Um, well, here we are. Obama came to see us. Um, so politics is calling, because politics needs to sort of get back to the hospital bed. Um, hosp you know, to, to the hospital bed that it's not really looking at the ceiling of in many cases. So hospitals, so um, politics is coming to us and saying, how can we be more innovative? How can we be more human-centered? So. The Obama administration is talking to us right now. This is me in Iceland. I was on stage in Iceland. I was on TV in Iceland talking about the whole idea of helping them get through the economic crisis that they're now in. Translating our work into other languages. Helping go on things like Facebook and make the whole conversation completely transparent. So again, how can we all help Iceland get out of its economic meltdown? This got 6,000 replies in the last space of a weekend. People are really excited to contribute. Translating design thinking into Icelandic, 
oh my God, how complicated was that? So, you know, making sure that we're the nuance, the cultural nuance of what we do is, is making sense as well. So that's one of the projects we're working on right now. Um, the first thing we did, I'm going to show you a quick two-second clip of this. The first thing we did for the Icelandic people was we actually made a film, Back to the Hospital Bed. Um, I remember talking in Parliament there and saying, do you guys actually know how the regular Icelandic fisherman or the regular Icelandic factory worker really feels about what's going on? You're talking to people in Reykjavik who are very sophisticated. I think you need to get out to the villages. So we sent a local young Icelandic filmmaker who did this for free because he believed in the cause out to Selfoss in the south of Iceland and he made this film for us. This lady, that's the first lady you'll see has leukemia. So she's really in a bad in, in way. <laughs> og bara þú veist það var gaman og að skemmta mér og bara en núna einhvern veginn þá er maður heldur maður sé þú veist maður er ekki að, ekki alveg í þeim hugleiðingum maður vill frekar og eins og ég ætla að fara í nám núna kannski í haust sem er ekki ég get ekki ekki lán fyrir því þannig að þú veist þá missi ég vinnuna mína ef ég fyrir það nám og þannig raunar er ég bara svona var að reyna að halda í vinnuna sína og frekar þá fresta námi og mm -hmm. en svo getur maður náttla verið að taki bara eitthvað ár eða tvö og þú veist og Það verður alltaf lægi eftir eitthvað tíma, þú veist, ég bara, maður veit það ekki náttúrulega. Já. This is seven and a half minutes long. This played live on Icelandic television. And, you know, and again, we got mobbed, kind of, I got mobbed at the airport in a good way by people going, Christ, you know, these guys need to hear us. So again, sort of back to the very beginning of this talk, the are you looking at the roof? They weren't looking at the roof. They just weren't. They were off in political rhetoric, and they'd totally forgotten the people who were actually the problem or who, who they needed to address the problem for. So this world continues. So we're out in the Middle East at the moment. I went and gave a talk at one of the TED events in the Middle East around economic growth. What was really interesting at this event was this, was women. Middle East and women, very, very difficult. Um, and I ended up becoming really involved in conversations about equality, about education for women there, and what that could mean. Ended up having some fascinating conversations with some dignitaries there, which I will talk about the, the, the last one of the last slides. Middle East, education, huge. So again, big social issues, wow. Um, so questions such as, and this is what I asked on the stage in the Middle East, how will countries be designed in the future? Wow. Um, these guys here, these are the wild Peter boys. Um, they're an Emirati sort of rock and roll uh, cooking, cooking um, they have a sh what's called a shawarma brand, which is like the sort of Starbucks of sandwiches out in the Middle East. And we've been working with these guys, helping them create kind of local entrepreneurial culture, which is lovely. Finally, last couple of things. Center for Disease Control in Atlanta came to us and said, ha obesity, one of the biggest problems in the world right now is the obesity crisis. What can we do about this? So helping them create policy. This is political policy we're designing. Um, but at the again, still not forgetting to root this in design, we kind of randomly again said in one of our brainstorms, well, hey, wouldn't it be great if the White House did a vegetable garden? So they did. Um, so, you know, these things, never forget that design is about tangibility. Design is about having ideas and design is about making stuff real. Design is not about abs abstraction and about debate. Design is about making stuff and doing stuff and creating stuff. And we firmly believe in that. So, last few slides and then I'm going to shut up summary. I think we've kind of learned to that this is about enriching our craft and that people want to design their own worlds. People want to be participating in this. Um, we've had to change our role as designers of stuff into one of ultimately empowering people to help them create themselves. And I think we used to be hired to design the answer. And as you see now from our most recent work, we're just helping identify the questions. And in many cases, we don't even answer them. We actually allow other people real people to design them themselves. So we're continually learning. So everything we do is about asking questions. So, you know, our entire website, Facebook, all the things we do, we're always saying, you know, what's keeping you up at night? How do you, how do you learn? We're constantly blogging. We're constantly, this is our climate change stuff we did recently for Copenhagen. We're constantly asking questions. And the most two, two most recent things to kind of close, close the loop. We're now starting work with Jamie Oliver on his TED Prize. So when I was asked to nominate my favorite designer to meet him at the end of it all was like, you know, coming, coming to heaven. So he's been given the TED Prize to help eradicate obesity in the US. We're helping involved in that. And I am trying to help organize a TED event in Tehran. And I'm really interested in doing this with a female Iranian colleague of mine. 
So back to women in the Middle East, this should be a really interesting one to get involved in. So we've got three questions for you, and then we are going to hopefully get some questions back from you. And I'm not going to say these in Spanish, but we have them translated. I hope this says, where's Spain on this journey? If this is a journey that we've been on, where is Spain going? I was in Australia recently, a couple of weeks ago, and the Australian design industry is obsessed with generating value right now. They want to be part of the social conversation. Again, obesity, education, healthcare, these issues are huge there, and the design community is really excited and engaging in those. So question two, what are the big social issues that design can engage with here in Spain, and how, and how does this all occur? And then finally, what are you all doing about it? You know, are you participating in this? Is this a conversation that you guys are excited about having? Does this feel like something that you want to participate in? And that means thank you. So, thank you. So, we've got three or four minutes. Any questions from anybody? I mean, questions, comments, are we crazy? Does it make sense? Gentlemen here. You're welcome. Yep. Yes. I do, yeah. Um, uh, incremental innovation can start from uh, people and learning what they do and what sort of needs they have. So uh, I understand you basically, in a way, agree with Norman in this case. Well, I think it's, I mean, again, I don't think there's, uh, the, the question, if everybody didn't hear it, was from, from the idea of big, big ideas versus small ideas and where's the starting place? Gentleman's from Finland. Um, which I spend a lot of time in Helsinki. Um, I mean, I don't think there's a single answer, one versus the other. I mean, I think, again, I'm a big believer in ideas that you can use rather than ideas that live in the abstract. And when clients come to us and say, I want to disrupt, the first question is why? If you want to turn something upside down, the question is usually why do you want to do that? If it's broken, fine. But if you're breaking it because you want to just break it for breaking sake, that's not a big idea, in my opinion. I mean, I'm a very big believer that, 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 that we should be designing things that our clients can make and that people can use. And I think behavior change is a journey, and it's difficult to get people to kind of leap 10 steps from one place to the other. And, they, and you have to take them on that journey, as we've, talked, as we've hopefully demonstrated here. Um, and you know, I think that, again, that technology is a disruptor and, that, and, that, and can be seen as such. But I don't think there's one hard and fast rule where people are, people are in one place and technology is at another. I think, again, as long as people at the end of the day are excited about going on the journey and can go on the journey and understand the journey that you're asking them to go on, then it doesn't matter how you start. But personally, my theory is start small. And we always say to our clients, don't reinvent everything. It's too complicated. It'll let your brain will explode. Start, sm start small. I think if I can add one thing to that, it's uh, you can start from technology when you're doing innovation, and oftentimes that's successful, but it's inherently limiting not to look at users at least in addition at the beginning. Yeah. Because if you start with technology and then you try to find applications for that technology, you're never going to look through the lens of how can I actually combine this technology with some maybe old technologies, mundane <laughs> technologies, to really meet some user need? On the, on the contrary, if I start with a user need and then look at, okay, yeah. what kind of technologies yeah, can I, I apply give to this, then you have a much richer palette and you don't have to kind of go through all permutations. A very specific example of that, I had a client that was very excited about a technology they created where your fridge and your milk bottle could communicate. They thought it was awesome. And they were like, oh, it's going to really reinvent the home purchasing experience because my milk bottle can suddenly be talking to my smart fridge. And we went out and not a single person cared. B and, but they could make it, and it was awesome, but nobody wanted it. And so again, this thing I always say about is just because you can doesn't mean you should. If you can make something, great, but people have to want it or people have to understand it. Gentlemen here. At the beginning, I quoted what design was about. Yes. And you said, uh, if I remember correctly, it was about change, caring, and optimism. Yes, change, impact, and optimism. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, what struck me throughout your presentation is that one common theme was about simplicity. 
Yes. And Good. I, I don't know if you agree I'm obsessed with simplicity. Again, it's the same thing as point. Simplicity to me, again, is really important. I, so many, I, we, we both stand in so many boardrooms around the world where there's some whiteboard with 5,000 triangles and bubbles on it, and yet nobody has a clue. So again, a very specific example, I was talking to a gentleman in the banking industry who said, um, he said very smartly actually, he said, um, we're terrified of simplicity in the financial world because somehow it demystifies what we're doing and we need to A, make it seem more valuable and more clever so that we seem as individuals more valuable and more clever in the process. So he sat at the top of a large financial institution. He said, I'll put a very simple idea out there to my organization, like why don't we do X? And he said, and 27 PowerPoints later, it comes back and nobody, including me, has a clue what it's about. That's the first problem. The second problem is that goes out into the world and the consumer and the person who's giving them the service are in a social contract where neither of them actually has a clue what they're talking about. And they're signing something that they don't understand why they're signing it and then they don't know how to ask the question and the whole thing disconnects. And he said, he, he said this great line, when did simplicity get so complicated? And I thought that was brilliant. So I'm, I'm with you. I think at the end of the day, the world is complicated enough and we should be doing things that make it easier for people to navigate and I think most successful things out in the world I mean everybody points at Apple Apple's one of those brands that's a fundamentally simple brand for people to understand that's why all our clients come to us and say we want to be the iPod of blah because that's become a shortcut for a simple experience that people can navigate last question lady there and then Ben's in an interview, have five extra minutes. Awesome. I'm Hello. just uh, interested in how your relationships start with your clients. And the way you talk about them, it sounds like they never know what they want and they you tell them what the brief is kind of thing. Um, it's, that's a great Maybe question. Maybe you could talk about that a bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, well, we have very varied relationships with our clients. I think, uh, And I think that they've changed in, 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 in along, uh, along the years. I think clients are coming to us now... In, in the olden days, and I would say this was probably up to about seven or eight years ago, clients had a very specific thing that they wanted to do. They wanted, I'll use this example again, they wanted a water bottle because they were in the water business and they would go, boom. And so we would run off and insightfully think about water. And now clients are going, I think, a, a, a client of ours actually uses this phrase, and I think this is a, best, I a better, better description than I can do. He said, I've moved from now to now what? And he said, I'm now looking at this thing and going, what does this mean for me? Where should I go with this? What's the business opportunity? What's the consumer need? Should I even be in this industry in the first place? How do I grow it? How do I transform it? And what do I, and what do I design around it? So the first part of our work has gone from just answering to diagnosing. I think we're in a diagnostic space now and our business development and our business development teams are much more diagnostic than they are sales. We're not selling a Chinese menu of things. We're actually diagnosing with a client together what are the opportunity spaces. So, and that's quite scary because, and again, a, a metaphor that is used often is that's quite foggy. We know that there's kind of land out there, but the client's going, shit. And so I think a lot of it is about confidence and about giving people the confidence that we kind of do this, but also that, you know, that they're going to have to kind of put themselves a little bit out there in order to do that. I mean, again, we always say this change is, is scary. And if you're asking to design something where you, you yourself don't really know where the outcome is going to go, that's a quite windy road. So I think our relation, I mean, I think the, the word that I would use for us, for our relationships with our clients, it has to be honest. Because you can't BS people at the beginning. You have to say to them, it's going to be terrifying. And we draw all these funny charts about moodometer and you're going to you're going to be at the bottom terrified at some point and don't worry and we, we know what that feels like. And we have to help sort of navigate that together. But we're very, in w and we don't do sort of client disco and we don't do all this kind of jazz hand stuff because it's vulnerable. So I think a lot of it is, it's, it's almost educative. That's probably a better word to use, educative for our clients. Does that, does that help? One last one, maybe. No? Are we done? Yes, gentleman here. In terms of intel intellectual property, mm -hmm. so how do you deal with that in general? Um, is it yours or theirs? Th there is no one rule. It depends, on the, it depends on the client. It depends on the space. It depends on the relationship that we create. It's becoming increasingly more difficult, as you would imagine. And, you know, again, I, I think we're increasingly saying to our clients, this is something you have to embrace. You have to be about transparency, owning 
things these days is increasingly difficult anyway, and proving that you own them is even more difficult. So can you be more transparent from the beginning? But, you know, we work extremely hard. We, we have an entire process internally of protecting ideas because if we didn't, we'd be out of business, and we're very grown up. It's one of the few things I would actually put my hand up and say we're grown up about is protection of our clients' ideas, because you can't be doing, you would, we'd be out of business if we had competing businesses you know, going on, and, and we were sharing that, we would never do that. So we encourage that we do as much encouragement up front about transparency, but if that once we come in house with that, we do everything we can to try and make sure that it's protected. It's tough, it's increasingly tough now within technology has made everything. And as we go into the network space, we're about to go into innovation network. Once that space opens up, you know, ideas are really gonna be out there in the public domain. Okay, I think we're five minutes over. Are we done? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Oui.